what was the motivation and idea behind this uh, event. Uh, the, there was twofold or even threefold, but first of all, uh, the situation of the language teaching at the universities, not only here, not only in New York, not only in the States, but even in other countries, uh, they are losing support, the support of government, for example, um, uh, here our department and other departments that, that teach languages had uh, support from State Department for many, many, many years, and also grants for students who want to pursue their, their further interest, uh, 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 academic, professional, uh, that all has been cut. And uh, of course not every university has money to pick up the cost. And, and at that point the language is, is dismantled. To keep steady and to fulfill the needs of students who want to pursue their professional and academic studies in language, um, the support is needed. So I just wanted to show the history, the turbulence in the past, how close or many uh, times in the history of Columbia University that was to, to closing the, the Polish program or the Slavic programs, right? So that was, uh, and also it is very fascinating, I think, to know the history of the, of the field. The, the, to, to learn the history of learning, why, who, for what money, who supports this. So I thought I teach here over 30 something years in different capacities, but I thought this is something that, that uh, sort of requires further interest and uh, people as I say people many uh, times ask me why dlaczego się uczą polskiego why and finally I after so many years I answer why not right because people should and but I want people to understand why that this is important language is a key key to literature key to uh, history key to understanding um, uh, progress, any any sort of progress. So uh, we, and when we understand, we can later or sooner or later support. I al also say to my students, when you will make career and you will make uh, money and you will be in a position to to make some decision, remember that this is something that needs support. So, um, and, and for academic, and, and also there was an academic reason. Um, I knew of these people who work on the history of Polish studies and Slavic studies, and I wanted this to be, you know, known to other people. Me to uh, open this very interesting and unusual symposium. You are really proud to offer our consulate patronage for this event. Consulate General of the Republic of Poland, uh, Justice and a Consulate for the Matter is an outpost of the government in a foreign country. Our job is to be an intermediary, a middleman and sometimes, yes, a translator. We not only request and provide translation of official documents, we translate from one culture to another. Uh, we want Polish, not just Polish language, but also Polish history, culture and customs as well to be understood here in America. We are in awe of achievements of Professor Anna Freig, who relentlessly teaches Polish language and literature at Columbia University and who was instrumental in developing an idea of that session. Bilingual herself, a poet expressing herself in two languages, she tries to convince us participants of this symposium that even allegedly obscure languages such as Polish and even such esoteric disciplines as writing poetry and translating cannot only be satisfying on deep and intellectual level, but that they 
can also help in our professional life and our careers. I can't wait to meet those American students, often with no links to Poland whatsoever, who now do sophisticated translations of idiosyncratic Polish literature, making it accessible to American readers. I'm also eager to hear how it all became possible who really brought teaching of Polish language to your prestigious school. I think that after the session I will know the answers. My congratulations again for organizing this event. So important to everyone who was writing, reading and translating from one language to another. Thank you so much. Professor Mikos is a professor and chair of the Department of Foreign Languages and Literature at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where he has been working for the last uh, 36 years, I have, uh, I have counted. After receiving his PhD in linguistics from Brown University, he has been uh, at Wisconsin and uh, he is an author of numerous books about Polish literature, including a uh, book on Mitzki, Adam Mickiewicz and Jelisz Słowacki, uh, Polish Baroque Romanticism. He's also an author of anthologies and textbooks. His very recent book, published in, in Polish language, is uh, about the history of, uh, of uh, Polonistyka in Polish, the, uh, the Polish, uh, Polish language studies in uh, North uh, America, published in 2012. Um, I also would like to add that Professor Mikos is the director of the best um, summer school, school of Polish language in Poland, has a really a, a great reputation. Uh, this summer school is at the Catholic University of Lublin in Poland. Um, and today his talk is about Polish language and literature at Columbia and its early history. I apologize for my voice, but I will endure it. I'll go through it, even if I have to speak like that. I'd like to also thank you for uh, being here to celebrate the program. It has been and still is one of the best programs uh, in this country of Slavic languages and literature, owing to the prominence of the university and its faculty. In addition, this year we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the appointment of the first professor of Slavonic languages at Columbia. By way of a brief historical introduction, in 1875, the three Columbia faculties consisted only of 13 professors and two adjunct professors. Several modern languages, mainly German and French, have been offered <coughs> as optional classes at a number of American universities and colleges as early as in the 18th century. Uh, by 1884, for example, 19 of some 60 colleges canvassed required at least one modern foreign language for an undergraduate degree. It was the foundation of the Modern Languages Association of America in 1883 which uh, gave impetus to the creation of new departments, research and teaching of the modern languages. Columbia granted its first PhD in German in 1886, while the Department of Romance Languages uh, and Literatures was created in 1890. So we are talking about the end of the 19th century. The history of teaching Slavic studies in the United States began at Harvard. Their founder was Archibald Coolidge, a diplomat, professor of history, and the first director of the library. For two years, he toured Europe, including Poland, where he visited a school in Zakopane established by Jadwiga Zamoyska for the training of young women in the household arts. After working as secretary of the American legation in St. Petersburg and in Vienna, he returned to Harvard in 1894 he began teaching a course on the history of Northern and Eastern Europe, including Poland and Russia. Polish has been taught regularly at Columbia since 1916, Russian since 1913. On October 18, 1916, Prince informed Secretary Fackenthal that there are five students in Polish under Mr. Joseph Schlenker. The next instructor was L.K. Strasiewicz, Ignacy Paderewski's secretary, then Dr. Albert morawski nalenc also known as, known as Wojciech Morawski, a friend of Władysław Raymond, who was instrumental in negotiating the publication of Chłopi in the United States. 
from 1920 to 1924, for example, Moravsky now in stock, Elementary Powers, Advanced Powers, and History of the Political and Cultural Evolution of Poland, while Professor Prince taught History of Poland, uh, Serbia, and Bulgaria. In 1927, a plan to create an Institute of Polish Culture at Columbia was announced by Professor Clarice Manning. A long article in the New York Times, uh, 1927, gave an auspicious description of this undertaking. Jan Czechanowski, Polish minister in Washington, was a patron of the Institute, while Ignacy Paderewski and Dr. Nicholas Butler, its president, the ambitious program included the publication of books, articles on subjects connected with the language, literature, art, history and culture of Poland, organization of lecture tours and tours to Poland. In addition, it foresaw maintenance of the Bureau of General Information concerning Poland, organization and maintenance of Polish clubs and associations in schools and colleges. The plan also envisioned a library dealing with Poland, its literature and culture, the program also aimed at encouraging of Polish at Columbia, offering concerts of Polish music and art exhibitions. The idea of establishing the Institute met with strong support in Poland and the United States. Professor Roman Dybowski, speaking on behalf of the Chancellor and Senate of the Jagiellonian University, sent most sincere wishes for the prosperous development of this new center of competent information in all aspects of Polish intellectual and social life. Uh, and uh, President Butler endorsed the move and expressed his pleasure, and I quote here, still another movement in underway, is underway to increase our international contacts and international influence. It will be an admirable addition to our multiplying resources for a knowledge of the world if we can build up an institute of Polish culture similar to the other institutes that are already underway. The, article ended with an announcement that an advisory committee of foreign and American educators, writers, publishers, and publishers has been selected. In June 1925, Arthur Coleman defended his Columbia PhD dissertation. In 1928, began to teach Polish language courses. His mentor was John Prince. Uh, in 1931, Columbia offered him a contract to teach Polish as lecturer in Polish. Since 1934, he was assisted by the Reverend Stanislaw Sobinowski, a graduate of the Aguilonian University. He continued teaching until 1948, when he resigned his position of assistant professor in protest of establishing the Adam Mickiewicz chair, subsidized by the communist government of Poland. Coleman was born in Seymour, Connecticut, of Irish ancestry. As a young man, he came in contact with the Poles, Russians, and Belarusians who worked in his father's apple orchard. In 1915, he started studying the Russian language from a Russian made easy taken out of the Waterbury Public Library. Mm -hmm. He continued under the direction of Max Mandel, instructor at the Yale. He subsequently studied at the Charles University in Prague. Uh, a rationalist by training, he learned Polish and devoted himself primarily to Polish language, literature, and culture. Assisted by Marion Moore Coleman, his indefatigable wife and co-author of many of his works, he frequently traveled to Poland, leaving it on his last trip on August 31, 1939. He made many Polish friends and became recognized as an ambassador of Polish culture in the United States. Among his Polish awards was the Polonia Restituta Medal, Złoty Wawrzyn Akademicki, Polskiej Akademii Nauk, and the award of the Polish Pen Club. After leaving Columbia, he continued his academic career, working from 1950 to 62 as president of the Alliance College in Cambridge Springs. Coleman's published writings fall into several categories, books and papers on literature, language, and culture of Poland, Russia, Bulgaria, Bohemia, Slovakia, Ruthenia, and Ukraine, to mention the wooden churches of Ruthenia, language as a factor in Polish nationalism, brief survey of Ukrainian literature, Pushkin and Mickiewicz, Adam Mickiewicz in English. He translated three works together with his wife, Maria by Malczewski, Mary, Mary Stewart by Słowacki, and Made in Vows by Fedro. He compiled numerous directories of scholars of Slavonic studies in the United States, and the uh, report on the status of Russian and other Slavic and East European languages in the educational institution, institutions of the United States. He 
He wrote numerous articles and published in American newspapers and magazines and contributed to the profession. He is considered the one person most responsible for the founding of the American Association of the Teachers of Slavic and East European Languages, ATSIL. He had been delegate since 1946 to 58 and served in turn eight years as secretary, treasurer, and in other functions. In addition, the Coleman's worked tirelessly to attract students and promote cultural activities. At Columbia, they organized Klub Polski, then the chorus of Klub Polski, staged fragments of many plays and invited speakers, among them Czesław Miłosz in 1946. On July 19, 1945, Sylvian Strakacz, Consul General of the Polish uh, Embassy in New York, the last uh, free representative of Poland, and former Secretary of Ignacy Paderewski wrote to the Colmans expressing his sincere gratitude for your untiring efforts to sponsor the Polish culture at the Columbia University. The Colmans worked hard to integrate the university with the Polish community in addition to summer courses at Columbia. Uh, he taught uh, at New York, New Haven, Wilkesbury. He con his co contribution to popularizing the Polish language, literature, and culture remained highly valuable, while his role as ambassador of Polish has been undiminished to this time. So had been the efforts of Marion Moore Coleman, who continued her work as a propagator of Polish culture long after his ha her husband's death. I would like to conclude this paper with a list of instructors who have taught Polish at Columbia. Robert Bernhardt, Arthur Coleman, Maria Jedusicka, Anna Freilich Zajons, David Goldfarb, Elizabeth Kosakowska, Manfred Kriegel, Ludwig Krzyżanowski, Robert McGuire, Albert Morawski Nawecz, Harold Sido, Stanisław Sobiniowski, M.K. Strasiewicz, Christina Olser, Joseph Schlenker, Ross Kupberg, and I would like also to give credit to all the students who have taken courses in Polish language, literature, and culture at Columbia. They deserve this recognition because, in Professor Freilich's words, student polonistically, ambassador Polskości. Before I present the core of my first paper related to the 1940s and 1950s, and Polish studies at Columbia, I have to draw shortly contextual background for this story that is Manfred Krill history till 1940 and his immigration to the US because it is crucial to understand his American part of life. Shortly speaking, this academic career of Krill in Poland divides into two stages. During the first period, till 1932, Krill was working in high school and part-time at university in Warsaw and Brussels. Initially, he was involved in traditional literary studies, editing works of Polish Romantic poets, and writing handbooks and textbooks on history of Polish literature. The second period, between 1932 and 40, started with taking uh, the chair of Polish literary theory at the University in Vilnius. At that time, he succeeded in assembling and supporting a group of young, talented people from Vilnius, uh, Warsaw and Poznań, who introduced a modern approach to literature and literary studies. It was a fundamental novel change in the Polish academic milieu, while Creed became a coreferous of a new methodological revolution and theoretical term. He focused on the development of the integral method, that was his own term for Polish school, school formalist or structuralistic approach, presented in his introduction to the study of literary work. And in long run, many adherents of, of this Vilnius circle made significant contribution in the field after 1948, uh, 1945, including Maria Żołuska, Czesław Skorzewski, Maria Renata Majenowa, Irena Sławinska, etc. And um, there's no doubt that Creed was, in this interwar period, one of the most important figures in Polish literary studies uh, at that time. And in 1940, he had to escape. And he immigrated through Scandinavia, Belgium, France, and Portugal to the US. Before World War II, in Europe, Creed had been studying and working in the German-speaking and Francophone academic world. 
His knowledge of English was rather poor and even though he became familiar with it during the first years in the United States, it was still difficult to preserve his academic interest by writing in English. Moreover, we should remember that there were more people from Vilnius University uh, who were trying to help him in the US, psychologist Bogdan Zabatsky and great mathematician Antoni Zygmunt, etc. And in late July 1943, with a historian and director and then president of the Polish Institute, Oskar Halecki, and Slavist literary historian in the field of Russian literature and Russian studies, Václav Lednitsky, they started their trip to the US. Fritz had arranged lectureship in comparative literature, literature at Smith College in Northampton. However, Fritz, uh, he had to wait for Columbia next eight years. However, he had some connections with Columbia at that time. First of all, we have to mention his lecture in Polish titled Typ Kulturalne Polaka w Epoce Porozbiorowej, so the cultural type or character of Pol in post partition era on October 24. On the other hand, we have to remember trivial truth that he was here in the United States just a part of Slavic studies and minority Polish within minority Slavic, whereas in interwar Poland, he had professorship and chair of the one of the most important and prestigious Polish. Uh, so their national literature department in the, in the country in Vilnius. And what is more, he was so active on different fields, so innovative, that he was one of the most important figures of Polish interwar intellectual life, both strictly academic and wider as a public intellectual. His position was really unquestionable. Even though he was more than 50 years old when, with young generation of Polish studies scholars and students, he started theoretical. Before I, I start my my uh, talk, uh, I would like to thank people who helped me organizing it, and Professor Alan Timberlake enormously, and Alan Rachkov from uh, the director of Harman. Institute and now mostly and also Bradley Gorski produced this terrific uh, uh, poster and uh, I thank also Tatiana Biewo-Borodowa and Kevin Halinak. Archive, archive of Shadows of Polish Institute at Columbia. The history of Slavic studies and Polish studies at Columbia fascinated me for a long time. From time to time, I committed some popular articles in Polish on that topic, and I remember discussing some aspects with Professor Robert Belknap and Robert Maguire, who were students of Professor Manfred Fried and Professor Ludwig Krzyżanowski in the 50s. Today, I don't have much to add to the captivating talks we have had here. At least, for me, that was, that was fascinating. What I would like to share with you are samples of some archival documents related to the creation of Polish Institute here at Columbia in the 1920s. Accidentally, a friend of mine, Lucian Śniadower, while doing his own research at Bibliothèque Nationale de France, sorry for my accent, came across correspondence between Clarence A. Manning acting head of the Slavic department in the 1920s, and Marie, Marie Curie, Curie, Swod, Curie, Swod, Swodowska and Nicolas Curie, right? Nicolas Butler, the president of Columbia University in the years, uh, as Professor Nikos uh, said, 1903 to 1945. These findings and the sole tenor of these letters prompted me to look for some, something more here at Columbia Archives. And with the help of the university archivist, Jocelyn Wilk, I was lucky to find several letters to create, that create sort of a conversation on the, on the topic. At that time, 
under a very energetic leadership of President Nicholas Butler, philosopher, educator, and as we heard, a Nobel Prize Peace uh, Laureate, uh, Colombia established a number of foreign languages and culture institutes. When we walk by Casa Italiana, built in 1926-27, Casa Hispanica, built in 1920, the La Maison Francaise, established in 1911, Deutsches Haus, established in 1913, we look at the milestones of this university and the New York City itself. I distinguish built from established because some institutes travel from one location to another. The documents that came my way are archival shadows of the same history, to a great extent political history. While reading Clarence Manning, A History of Slavic Studies in the United States, one sees that there were always political reasons underlying language teaching. Even creation of language institute and their functions were determined, determined by political motives. The fascination with or the prejudice against the language of the enemy affected the enrollment, the financial support, as it does to this day. The waves of enthusiasm or fashions for language cannot create a On, only the waves of, of enthusiasm and of fashions for language cannot create a solid base for an academic curriculum. On the other hand, there is an understanding that we need to know the language, even the language of the enemy, and of course, of an ally as well. Few of the institutes I mentioned underwent quite turbulent transformations and some Slavic programs were sus suspended for a while. According to Clarence Manning, the years of the Depression in many ways produced another period of marking time in Slavic studies. For the most part, efforts of the Slavic groups to introduce their languages into, American, into the American educational system were retarded while available finances were restricted to relief purposes, end of quotation. And this might be the reason that Polish house has not been built here at Columbia. Before I get to the documents re related specifically to the institute, I want to present the few documents indicated that the new interwar Polish government Interwar, I mean 19, 19, 1939, uh, quite early displayed a genuine interest in supporting Polish language at Colombia. And how one displays a genuine interest? By sending the money. <laughs> On November 2, 1924, the secretary of the university, quoted here many times, Frank Fackenthal, wrote to the acting head of Slavonic department. Dear Professor Manis, I have your letter of the 29th in regard to $50 from the fund from Pol the Polish government. Let me have some phrase in writing to the treasurer that will indicate the use to which you will put the $50. This is simply a matter for the accounting record so that the books will correspond to the terms of the gift. The check for $1,200 for the current year has come in very truly yours, Frank Fackenthal. Uh, on November 30th, 1924, Clarence Uh, Manning writes to the secretary of the university. Dear, my dear Mr. Secretary, will you ask the treasurer to send me $50 for the balance of the fund donated by the Polish government? The Polish minister told me the other day that he was taking steps to send us the same amount, $1,200, this year. In case He sends it directly to the treasurer. Will you please notify me when it arrives? Yours very truly, Clarence 
management of the university replied the next day. Uh, Dear Professor Manis, I am glad to know from yours of the 29th. That's how he writes in all his letters. Not your letter, but yours of the 29th. That still another movement is underway to increase our international contact and international influence. It will be an admirable addition to our multiplying resources for a knowledge of the world if we can build up an institute of Polish culture similar to the other institutes that are already underway. Poland has a history, a literature, and an art which deserves our close and sympathetic study, and we must find ways and means to master the difficulty which language interposes in order to come to a fuller and deeper appreciation of the Polish contribution to our modern civilization. And this is Nicholas Murel Butler, and the, the, this is his letters. And I am reading this, and then December, December 7. This is the letter to Madame Curie. In this connection, we are endeavoring to organize under the auspices of Columbia University an Institute of Polish Culture, which is to serve as a means of developing in America interest of Polish culture in all its branches. This is similar in scope to the institutes of French, Italian, Spanish, Romanian, and Czechoslovak studies, which have already been established. President Butler and His Excellency, the Polish Minister in Washington, and Mr. Padarewski have accepted the post of honorary president in this organization, and it is intended that the whole institute shall be under the pat patronage of His Excellency, the President of Poland. Because of your recognized position as one of the foremost Polish scientists, and also because of your connection with Columbia University, we hope that you will do us the honor of becoming an honorary member of this institute. We also should appreciate your opinion as to the value of this undertaking and the points of activity which you feel that we should especially emphasize as well as the privilege of publishing this statement or a portion of it in our endeavor to show to the American people that this movement has the appreciation and sympathy of leaders of Polish life and thought. I am closing here with a letter from President Butler endorsing the proposed institute and also a detailed statement which we have prepared to show the scope of the work, which we hope to do as the resource of the institute permits. And I trusting that you will honor us with your sympathy and cooperation, yours very true, truly, Clarence Mann. Three and a half months later, Maria Kiris Kłodowska responded in French, and I'm reading the translation of Joanna Zaitas, graduate of Columbia University and currently a student at Columbia Law School, which I thank you very much for the translation. Uh, Mr. President, meaning this is to, to the Clarence Manning, which was, who was already the president of the uh, institute. I rather long, a rather long absence from Paris delayed my reply to your letter, for which I apologize. It, it is with delight that I learn about the creation of the Polish Cultural Institute at Columbia University designed to develop intellectual relations between the United States and Poland. The program of the Institute as presented in your letter appears to me extraordinarily encouraging and well adapted to the needs of the cause to be served by the Institute. My appreciation for the initiative of Columbia University regarding the creation of a Polish cultural institute is motivated twofold. On the one hand, from the vantage point of the attachment I have for my country of origin, 
And on the other hand, as a member of the International Commission for Intellectual Cooperation of the League of Nations, I fully support the efforts of Columbia University aimed at reinforcing intellectual relations between the United States and other nations through the creation of the, an institute specifically dedicated to, that pur to this pur purpose. To the extent it would appear possible, I would like to envision creating a foundation of day studies at the new institute for students who would like to work there. The other institute are institutes that have been established in the first three decades of the 20th century and survived the turmoil, even those institutions underwent difficult times. The Casa Italiana is a fascinating and still controversial sample. Uh, the situation of language teaching is very unstable, less commonly taught languages instructors. Columbia University picked up the tab. The shadows of the Institute of Polish Culture are deeply hidden in the archives. But perhaps in the future, the State Department renews its former commitments and the Polish government will acquire the interest. Students will be able to walk by the step or walk by and step in the real Polski Dome, <laughs> housing a genuine institute on the campus of Columbia. And the Polish chair established in the last years is a good first step. <laughs> The question is, uh, how many, is, is there a, a lot of students who studied Polish, learned Polish here, and, uh, and uh, continue it uh, uh, in their uh, professional and academic development? A lot. I could have three or four panels only of students who are pr professors, who, who learn Polish here, started from the very beginning, right? Mama, Tata, and so on, and who are professors in American universities and in the universities uh, in other countries. Um, the history students, a lot, but not only students of different cultures, students of, uh, for example, uh, German uh, studies who uh, combine. Uh, some fascinating topics, and also translators. There are a few, we will, talk, we will talk to one, but there are several people who are translators of Polish, uh, uh, whatever, uh, either their uh, uh, literature or, 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 or scientific studies. And, uh, and also we will see a student who is a, a, a specialist in polymery and who uh, what it was not easy for him and he didn't have to nobody but he wanted to study Polish and now he is a specialist uh, already got a post uh, doctoral uh, very very um, prestigious award and he goes to Poland and he teaches at the uh, he gives a talks at the university, not in Polish, but he wrote to me, Do you have Paul stay with you and Popolsku? I came Thank here you. to study European history and imagined myself as a Germanist, but was interested in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, like William, I'm sort of a child of the, the late Cold War, growing up in the 70s and 80s, um, was fascinated by communism. And so when I got to graduate school thinking about European history, I thought I, I don't want to just focus on, on Western Europe. I'd like to bring Eastern Europe into it and, and chose sort of half intentionally, half randomly to take Polish. I, mean, I could have taken a number of other languages um, in the, the Eastern Soviet bloc, uh, but chose Polish. And, and studying Polish, for me, it really opened up a new world new opportunities, uh, like Nancy Sinkoff, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my research and also uh, my teaching and how Polish interacts with that, Polish culture, Polish language. Um, so, but before I get into those two areas, maybe I'll, I'll talk just briefly about my uh, study of Polish, which included three years here at Columbia. Um, 
I, I, that gave me a, a very, very strong basis uh, in the Polish language. And then I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in Poland in the summers between my first few years. Studied in Gdańsk, actually in Sopot, in fact, uh, a summer school also in Kraków, and a pre dissertation fellowship to study in, in Kraków again, uh, the Agalonian University for a semester, uh, focusing on the language, also getting background on the history and culture. Um, and then I did my dissertation research in Warsaw, was there for six months, and it was the interaction with the, the Archiva Maknowicz and, and Stalinist uh, bureaucraties which helped me achieve a, a sufficient level of proficiency in Polish of a particular kind, but uh, nonetheless uh, enough to, um, to, to deal with these documents and incorporate uh, Polish language documents into my, my own research. So Columbia and, and my years here with Anna gave me this, this basis to pursue these interests in history and again really opened new vistas for me. Um, I, I came into Columbia with much more background in Western Europe, had studied in France for a year, gotten a degree there, and traveled and spent a lot of time in, in Western Europe. Really, as I mentioned, was interested in German history, um, but wanted to do a, a comparative transnational project. And so looked east, embraced Polish, uh, got increasingly interested in the Cold War, the Soviet bloc, and communism, the, the lived experience of communism. And of course, Colombia was a perfect place to do that with its strengths in German history and in East Central Europe, Harriman Institute and its associated institutes. Um, so my dissertation, which I finished in 2004, which resulted in a book that came out uh, a couple years ago, um, looked at um, Stalinist Poland and East Germany, so a comparative study, um, and used the prism of music to try to understand this formative decade of communism in East Central Europe. And I was looking at both the way party officials and cultural elites created the new music of the Stalinist era, of the socialist era as it was conceptualized, um, this, this music of mass songs and uh, oratorios and praise of the five-year plan and Stalin. And I tried to, to listen to this music and understand this music not merely as propaganda, but as co-produced culture, that these individuals in both Poland and East Germany were, were trying to, to figure out what was going on in the late 1940s and early 1950s and to embrace certain initiatives coming from above. So you know, luminaries of Polish culture, someone like uh, Vito Ludosławski or Andrzej Panufnik, at this time they composed a number of mass songs about Nova Huta, about peace, um, you know, praising uh, the five-year plan, uh, holding up their, the, the comrade as the, the ideal, and the like, uh, Ludosławski, composed a, um, what we would call a, a cantata celebrating the fifth anniversary of the, the so-called liberation of Poland by the Soviet Union. Little of this was known, and, and I can even relate, I was in uh, Keele University just outside Manchester a month ago for a conference focusing on Ludoswowski. And this period of his life is little known. It's hard to integrate it into our, our larger understanding of someone like Ludoswowski, Panufnik, many other leading Polish composers. They themselves tried to cover over this era, were somewhat embarrassed by these compositions, perhaps unsurprisingly. And so knowing Polish, spending time in Polish archives, and uncovering documents, protocols, and meetings, letters where these composers discuss these works, and and, and clearly we're, we're trying to compose a music that they could be proud of, that satisfied some of the ideals of the Stalinist state, there was a um, real engagement from Polish cultural elites. Um, I then, also in the, the dissertation and the book, looked at the way this music circulated in the population more broadly. The, the Polish and East German state invested lots of resources in creating new performing ensembles and bringing this music out to the workers and peasants of People's Poland and the German Democratic Republic. Um, new forms of music were created, so these kind of 
variety shows that incorporated mass songs, snippets of longer works, uh, spoken poetry, of course, uh, political um, speeches as well. And so try to understand this moment both on an elite as well as a popular level. And of course, I mean, this goes without saying, much like um, the previous presentation, knowledge of Polish was absolutely essential to conduct this project, to spend the time in Poland, to go into the archives to find, read, interpret these documents. Um, the next project that I'm currently working on, and I might say this, uh, yeah, so th this book came out with Purdue University Press two years ago in a, an innovative publishing platform with a nonprofit organization called Knowledge Unlatched. Once it sold a certain number of copies, it entered the public domain and it can be downloaded for free as an ebook. So I would encourage you all, obviously, to do that. It can be purchased still uh, as in hardback, um, but it can also be read as, as an ebook as part of the public domain. Uh, the current project that I'm working on continues my exploration of lived socialism, again, focusing on the two countries that I know best, the languages I speak, uh, German and Polish, so East Germany and the People's Republic of Poland. Again, trying to understand this moment in Polish history, these decades uh, from the 1940s through the 1980s. And I'm looking at sort of worldviews and mentalities in the two countries. And the way I'm approaching it in this project is by looking at um, the construction of friends and enemies of the, the socialist world, of the, the Soviet bloc, again, my two case studies, East Germany and Poland, and looking at the way these friends and enemies were constructed as symbols and as representations, and the way then these circulated among the populations of the Soviet bloc in order to create a new socialist society and the new socialist citizen. And I've chosen several examples where the, these representations were not fixed, they changed, uh, and to see how this then was reconceptualized and how the populations of these countries reacted to this. So China, for instance, celebrated uh, from 1949 as the, the newest member of the Soviet bloc, uh, held up as a, as a great example for other countries, uh, uh, and, society and some Chinese individuals to be emulated, uh, providing an example uh, for communists, for the communist society of, uh, of East Germany and Poland. Um, actually, and I taught a course on um, the liter, what was it called? It was called Angry Young Decade, which was about 1955 to 1965 in the USA, Great Britain, um, Russia, and Poland which um, is a 55, 65 is a very understudied uh, decade, and it's, you know, everybody talks about 68, or at least American students talk to talk of 1968, but nothing happens from nowhere. So to me, this was a fascinating decade, and we, we studied a lot of Polish literature in that class, and um, some of it uh, was literature that had been translated. Um, we read Moscow. Uh, stuff that had been translated, that had been published, and at that point my translation still wasn't published, so we read fragments of, you know, my translation that was still being worked on. We read um, Edward Stahura, Andrzej Bursa, um, and so, and the students loved this stuff, and they had never heard of these names before, even though some of them were available in English, some of them were not yet available, but the students would have never encountered, the, I mean, you know, you could walk into a thousand bookstores and never see Manapostovo or Andrzej Bursa or Edward Stapura. So it was great to see that this literature that I love, that meant a lot to me, really got the students very excited. And and I'm sure I, I haven't followed up, but I, I'm sure that you know many of them have continued their interests in Polish. And, and that, so that's a sort of incredible thing to be able to expose students to this world. Um, and another, we we even listened to Agnieszka uh, Oshetska, and I translated a couple songs and a couple poems for her. Uh, and I was introduced to Oshetsko by climbing out of class one day. But, um, so it was great to be able to expose them to this world that they never would have known, and I believe that enriched their understanding of, of, of a decade in the history of the world. Um, another, um, I say another way that I'm involved in, still involved in, in Polish, and I'm still a PhD candidate here, 
um, I'm writing my dissertation on uh, a Russian singer-songwriter, Vladimir Vysotsky. I'm translating his short stories and writing an introduction to them. But I was just in the Polish city of Koshalin for a, there's the, um, a museum in the Polish city of Koshalin dedicated to Vysotsky, um, which is one of the strangest you know, occurrences that are probably in history. Um, but there's this museum, Wojimierza uh, Wysockiego, and there's an international film festival there. And so I was just there um, to do research on my dissertation, but it was incredible being with Polish scholars, Russian scholars, there were Armenian scholars, there was a Japanese woman. Um, there were people from all over the world who had convened in Poland um, to talk about this, this Russian bar. Um, and and in just this strange world of connections, the, the reason that I was invited to this conference was because I had given, um, I had talked about my work as a translator with, actually with Andrzej Dobrowolski, um, translating Paniana's poetry and translating Maja Bosco, and the organizer of the conference had read about, that I said I was, my next project was translating Wysotsky, and she'd read my interview in a Polish newspaper. So um, there are all these you know, funny connections. And uh, another, uh, another way that I'm connected with Polish literature and with the Polish language and how studying here has really made a huge difference in my life and how knowing Polish has made a difference in my life is that a few years ago I started a publishing house um, called New Vessel Press. There are catalogs over there which I'll leave on the table. Um, but we have now published, we've published 12 books so far and three of them have been Polish books. Um, so those are pretty good. Aunts. Um, we published two, two Bosco books, um, and this is actually coming out in August, by, a book by Andrzej Bursa, which until now has not been available in the States. So, you know, that is a way that I feel, um, I mean, certainly, obviously, I would have not known about any of these authors that had not studied Polish here, but also in being able to read things in the original um, and looking for new work, you know, we're always looking for new um, authors and these the three Polish um, books that we publish happen to be by authors who've been dead a while, but we're uh, considering living Polish authors as well. And it really helps me. There, there are two of us at the press, and it really helps me to be able to read things in the original and to be able to consider them without having to rely just on somebody's good opinion. Um, and, and so that is a way that I can, you know, I feel like I continue to expose people to Polish culture. Um, and I, I certainly, you know, would not have had, would not have had the ability, nor would I really have thought of doing it had I not. Uh, 2010, um, three years of courses, uh, which I took in addition to my main objective, which was a PhD program in chemical engineering. Um, when. Polish people learn that I speak Polish. They often say, Dlaczego? Why? Um, and the first guess is, is that, is my wife Polish? No, she's not. Um, but engineers like good challenges. Um, and I, I had a lot of Polish friends growing up. So it was something that I always wanted to learn. Um, but most universities just don't offer it. Um, so I didn't have that opportunity till I came to Columbia for grad school. And, and just because you're focused on uh, doing experiments in the lab um, doesn't mean that you should uh, stop trying to be a full person and lead a fulfilling life. Um, and so part of a graduate's stipend um, really goes to cover classes. So when you finish your science courses, um, it is possible, usually, to take outside courses um, without incurring extra costs. Um, you just need the permission of your advisor. Um, one of my favorite activities um, we did during the class uh, was probably something I felt the need to do. Um, I wrote a recipe for red beans and rice in Polish. Um, you know, oftentimes in language courses, uh, you converse with your classmates. That's kind of strange for an engineer. We don't 
<laughs> Sometimes it's weird talking to other people, especially in another language. Um, but it is important that we be able to describe in, in clear language what we've done um, so someone else around the world can uh, see that um, without having to be shown. Um, those are the communication skills you need in a science career. And I wasn't getting good data in the lab yet, um, so writing that uh, recipe really allowed me to start building that communication skill um, before I had the data to write papers and show that formally. Um, after graduation, um, I started a postdoc in uh, University of Texas. Um, it wasn't really the opportunity to uh, converse in Polish or even go to Greenpoint um, that I had in New, New York. Um, so I was really, uh, really missing that, um, and I was spending all the time in the lab. I still uh, kept in contact with uh, Professor Frolik and even uh, wrote a poem in Polish. Um, and she said I needed to go already. And I got to a point um, that I could take time away from the lab and go to Poland. Um, I really wanted to see uh, a polymer science laboratory in Poland. So I did take the initiative to reach out to uh, some of the professors uh, that were going to be in the cities that I was traveling to. Um, and one of the opportunities that came up just from taking Polish at Columbia is um, I just wanted to meet them, see their labs, uh, maybe uh, give a short presentation to their group. Uh, they allowed me to give uh, a departmental seminar. Um, and I, I think that opportunity started because I could um, write a whole email um, in Polish. And I'm sure it had lots of mistakes, but um, it wasn't the kind that would be introduced by a machine translator. Um, they're the cute human ones. <laughs> One other thing that, that came up in, in um, the lunch I had with my host is um, I said uh, I spoke at the, uh, the Faculty of Polymer Chemistry at uh, Warsaw Polytechnic University. And I said uh, 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 it's a real honor to speak here um, because I, I'm not a polymer chemist, but um, Poland itself um, has been responsible for uh, some real contributions in that field of polymer chemistry. Um, and he, he was really surprised. He didn't know who they were. He asked me to name them. Um, so I'll name them here. Um, Stephanie Kolek is a Polish, uh, she was a Polish American, and uh, she's the uh, she discovered the polymer that um, is used in Kevlar as bulletproof vests. Um, Michael Schwartz uh, was educated uh, in his bachelor's at Warsaw Polytechnic University. Um, he is the discoverer of that uh, ionic polymerizations are living and can be used to make uh, designer materials. And that's something that even though it was discovered in the 1950s, is still very fashionable in polymer research today. And I even use those polymers made by that method in my own research. And then uh, more recently, um, uh, Professor Krzysztof Mediaszewski at Carnegie Mellon um, has found ways to make those designer materials um, but they're, it's a much easier method that even engineers can use. And um, he's often thought of as on the Nobel Prize shortlist. So I always look to see um, for the Nobel Prize in chemistry if he's won it yet, but it hasn't happened yet. Knowing Polish, the language they undoubtedly spoke, is an essential tool for our task. Thank you. Polish origin here very often ask me why why the students uh, would would take Polish and uh, what I wanted to say Polish population why would they take Polish and after uh, after answering for several years why I now I answer why wouldn't they uh, so we have we have people who uh, are uh, 
Polish or Polish origin. It, de it depends uh, until the first, let's say I teach here over 30 years, the first uh, uh, years we have rarely Polish, Polish students, we have rather students, um, you know, like the third generation of, of Polish, the, the, the grandchildren of, uh, of uh, uh, emigre of, uh, of uh, the war, uh, after war emigration, the, the so-called uh, uh, political emigration. Um, and later we had um, pe people of Polish origin, but we had also um, Americans, who are, um, and the, the second panel will address this, who simply were interested in Polish history, Polish culture, Jewish history, um, and even, um, even economic, um, economic development and so on. Uh, because it's not, um, and, and of course, Sla uh, uh, students of Slavic languages, right, who have to uh, take a second, Slavic language. They they don't take Polish uh, because they they take something that interests interests them. Uh, the, the, the courses are first uh, are difficult in terms they have to take uh, three three times a week. They have to obtain a good grade because otherwise it lowers their their uh, uh, general uh, whatever it, it is called. What is called? <laughs> right, yeah. average. Yes. So they don't take for frivolous reasons because this is this is a this is a commitment, uh, and um, we have. Uh, I would say. We ha and we also cater to uh, NYU. We have students from NYU and uh, from other uh, schools that, that are in consortium. So student take, students take it really for, for, for reasons, regardless whether they are Polish or, or they are not Polish. As a newly appointed professor of uh, Polish studies, I have uh, met uh, several students who are interested in uh, Polish culture here at Columbia University. And these meetings were fascinating um, because most of the students I have met uh, have, are not Polish, have no Polish origins, and they um, came to study Polish history, culture, literature, simply um, because um, it was something new, something unknown, and something very unfamiliar. So, of course, here everybody, I ask myself how to convince a student at Colombia to study Poland and not uh, Venezuela or Colombia or, or Brazil. Uh, and. Um, I think what uh, what became so evident for me is that um, people like to study interesting topics and I think not Polish history or Polish culture because it's a Polish culture but because um, it represents people, themes, events, experiences that uh, no other culture can uh, replicate. Um, I also had a student who was a grand-granddaughter of the last Habsburg emperor, Franz uh, Josef. She was my student for half a year. And she said, well, this is an amazing opportunity to, start to see what happened in the lands that are now Poland, but that used to be a Habsburg empire. Um, uh, an empire that my family ruled, and uh, Colombia simply gathers people who are um, really extraordinary, like this young uh, woman. Um, there is also a student who, whom I met in the uh, course uh, about philosophy. It was. It is not a course uh, about Poland, but he. It turns out uh, that he's. Um, 
ancestors, uh, Jewish ancestors, uh, his grand, uh, grand, grand, grand father in the, from the Middle Ages, uh, Ab Roger Abolafia, um, created Kabbalah, Kabbalah, which is a cornerstone of Jewish culture, which is part of the Polish culture. And Kabbalah is uh, this mystical, philosophical knowledge that uh, thousands of people um, believed in and practiced uh, over centuries in Polish lands. And Michael Abolafia, uh, now a 19-year-old uh, American guy in a baseball uh, cap, uh, says, you know, I, um, I, I you know, I, I want to study Eastern Europe because my ancestors, uh, you know, invented Kabbalah. So, you know, this is just an amazing university where you can meet um, uh, people interested in Poland for all kinds of very strange reasons. Uh, maybe the last thing I would mention is a student who uh, wrote a seminar thesis, a paper about a, um, Pateusz Konwicki's book, Small Apocalypse, Mała Apokalipsa, and he was fascinated in socialist cities. At Columbia, um, he decided to pursue his interest in socialist cities because he was so fascinated with Warsaw, with the palace of youth and culture, and all the so, uh, Stalinist architecture that was simply interesting for him. He didn't see it through any kind of ideological lens. That he went on a trip from Berlin through, uh, through um, Minsk, uh, Moscow, to Juan Bator. And this was his summer trip. So Polish themes inspire uh, amazing experiences. Uh, Adam Mickiewicz controversy uh, that was occurring here in the United States. Now, I'm part of, of my family certainly is of the political uh, wartime immigrant uh, uh, generation. And I partly grew up in London, but I also grew up in uh, Argentina, where there was a, a considerable uh, Polish uh, community, about 30,000 families that came from England after the war, as we did. And uh, I can sort of relate to this something that might, might uh, now sound a little bit like paranoia about uh, the Polish communist uh, government infiltrating, so to speak, because it certainly did occur in uh, uh, other Polish <coughs> communities, large Polish communities all over the world. But, you know, it, it's a little hard to understand it today, but at the time we're talking immediate post-war situation, and we're talking people who for example, very large numbers who had gone through the Russian uh, deportations and, uh, uh, and afterwards joined uh, our uh, General Anders Army. It, they had a different perspective of what communists meant, uh, and certainly it, it would have uh, you know, exacerbated their attitude to anybody being uh, nominated by, say, uh, Polish authorities. So unfortunately, people who probably were very even anti-communist sometimes would fall victim to that uh, perspective. If uh, the government gives uh, money to the university, it, it is the university that decides who, uh, who is going to be, uh, occupy the chair that this is not uh, something that, that government that gives money can, can decide. As, as uh, far as uh, Miłosz uh, was concerned, as I, as I read all the documents, I mean, he wanted, he, he did a lot of popularizing work of Polish culture here in the United States. I mean, he did more while he was working, working for the Polish government, for Polish embassy, and then later as a professor, and then later as a, as a, a jobless 
uh, intellectual and then professor at uh, uh, Berkeley University. He did more than all, all uh, institutes established by government or other immigration and so on. Even you look at his, at his uh, contribution to the American uh, over of Polish literature, there is no one I mean who could who could do more, who could did more. Maybe someone could do. And as far as Professor Creed uh, is concerned, I I think he did um, sort of continue his um, theoretical uh, uh, interest uh, here as a professor. Why why am I saying that I I was not there, but. Um, I remember when I was studying Polish literature in Poland, I uh, found a, a book by a Putrament on Polish short story, theoretical book, which was written as a work for Professor Krit at Vilna University. And then, so many years later, 30 or 40, I don't know, Olga Scherer, wrote a book, dissertation, at Professor uh, Creedle, uh, under Professor Creedle's uh, uh, direction, on Polish short story. Terrific uh, book that I still use uh, when I teach short story here uh, at, at Columbia. And, and students, uh, I think they learn from this. So, so there, there is a line uh, that he, he continued his theoretical um, teaching. The knowledge of Polish culture, of Polish language, of Polish history, of Polish literature uh, has been useful for a lot of students in my experience. I have been teaching at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee for 37 years and it's useful on many levels. It's useful first of all in the local community. Many of these people belong to Polish organizations, they teach Polish, work with Polish com in Polish community, and these are the success stories of the local territory of our community. There are also many students who after graduating go away and we don't hear from them for quite a, lo a long time, but eventually we hear that they work in Warsaw, for example, for the Deutsche Bank, and they are doing a very good job because they know Polish, German, English. There are students who work as legal advisors in Europe, and also they tell me that the knowledge of Polish language was most important in obtaining the job. So uh, we look at this as a work which is to build for a long run, for a long tradition and for a long career. In Connecticut we have Polish studies program and we also wonder the question where the Polish language classes are going or the history of Poland, history of Eastern Europe. And I want to say that here I see it's one institution, one Pani Anna, and five incredibly interesting careers of people who took Polish language. And I uh, would like to say that the future is in people like you and other of my students who took Polish language and, you know, s frequently they went to take the language not knowing how they are going to use it. And then, of course, the career, the, the personal life, and everything built up. So I would see uh, maybe a short documentary quoting each one of you and many more of the students and have it shown on the website of the Polish Language Department at Columbia or any other institution to really show people the real example. Because we can talk about it, but we have to really show a future student a tangible results and benefits of taking Polish. I do also take people, uh, my students, to Poland and I show them how beautiful the country is. But knowing Polish maybe it's not as essential, but it's very helpful. So this year, two of my students who went with me want to go back. First, to teach English to the Polish students, but eventually maybe to stay and study. So I think if we show students that there is um, 
a really tangible benefit for them, this is going to build up. We never are going to have a lot of students, but those who will take time and effort to learn it, they are going to do something with it. So I think, you know, every one of you and, uh, you know, Pani Anna and many people like Pani Anna are doing a lot of great work and we have to support, you know, efforts like the endowed uh, Polish studies programs and any other programs and try to be very innovative to teach and to introduce Poland to students through film, through theater, literature, history and a few other mediums. Thank you. To jest dosyć imponujące, że język polski istnieje na takich uczelniach prestiżowych jak Harvard University, University czy należąca też do Ivy League, do tych najlepszych uniwersytetów na wschodnim obrzeżu, jak Columbia University. I jest zastanawiające dla mnie, dlaczego ci ludzie się uczą języka polskiego. Dlatego, że nie ukrywajmy się z polskiej perspektywy, to może trochę inaczej wygląda. Ale dla Amerykanów, dla ludzi mieszkających w Stanach Zjednoczonych, język polski no, jest jednym z tych blisko 200 języków, które, które, państw, które należą do nz -u. I, i jest, to, jest to, jak powiedziałem, ciekawe, że ci ludzie to robią. My wszyscy wiemy, y, jakieś mamy jednostkowe przykłady, dlaczego. To znaczy, że ktoś może miał rodzinę polską, ktoś inny się spotkał ze znajomymi, którzy, którzy, którzy go zachęcili do tego, jeszcze innego narzędzia. Czy ona namówiła, jeszcze innego, jeszcze inne zrobił to może z tego powodu, że chciały może jakiś biznes w przeszłości w Polsce, jeszcze inni dlatego, że chcieliby uczyć tego języka i jak zajmują się tematką słowiańską, to ten polski im się tam gdzieś oczywiście nasuwa jako jeden z ważnych języków. Natomiast to są wszystko takie bardzo anegdotyczne opowieści, czy z mojej strony, czy ze strony innych osób, których znam. Wydaje mi się, że było bardzo dobrze, gdyby ktoś się pokusił tutaj. Tutaj wiemy na przykład, że Fundacja Kościuszkowska czy inne instytucje mają różnych stypendystów, którym dają, dają fundusze na to, żeby przeprowadzali różne badania. Byłoby ciekawe się pokusić właśnie o takie badania. Ile osób się dokładnie uczy, dlaczego ci ludzie się uczą i wtedy wydaje mi się byłoby łatwiej nawet rozwinąć te programy polskie na, na takich uczelniach jak Kolumbia. Bo można by dać za przykład, właśnie ten pan się uczy dlatego, ten pan się uczy dlatego, ten pan się uczy dlatego, ucz się, a będziesz miał coś praktycznego z tego. Nie tylko ze względu na to, że to ładnie brzmi, że po polsku, dla nas właściwie na, najbardziej ładnie brzmi, ale żebyśmy mogli jakoś przekonać tych ludzi, że warto się y, uczyć po polsku, choćby dając przykład taki, że w tej chwili Polska jest, czy była do niedawna jedynym krajem, który się oparł w recesji, który ma sukcesy, że można robić biznes z Polaka, że można tę znajomość swojej kultury polskiej, literatury polskiej, historii polskiej jakoś spożytkować właśnie w Stanach Zjednoczonych także. Is that for so long Poland was, in some way, Poland and Polish culture was marginalized uh, during the the partitions, of course, and then the whole controversy in the interwar period and the communist propaganda against Poland. From the perspective of the average American, Poland is a non-existing entity, and um, I think one of the things that hopefully can happen now that Poland has re-entered uh, the Western world is to show that Poland and Polish culture are really an integral part of world culture. And if, if it's, uh, the country and the language are brought more into the center and shown, and it is shown that um, all of the world benefits. This is, is true about Poland and any number of other smaller and lesser taught countries and, and languages. And there's ne no necessarily practical answer to why should I study Polish, but there is a, a broader answer, and that is because Poland is an important part of world culture, and it's just as important to learn Polish as it is to learn French or Spanish or any other language. I've been asked by a number of institutions to give talks 
And I was zeroed in on the women's role. My mother was uh, in the Polish army. And uh, on the women's role in the, in the Polish uh, forces, armed forces. And I find that the most, uh, uh, how should I say, efficient way to start when I'm talking to American publics, I'm sorry I'm turning my back on somebody, on everybody. <laughs> um, I start with a map to show where Poland is. For example, I had a couple of talks to the American Association of University Women, and I found it really did illustrate things. If you show a map, I usually start with a map before partitions, during partitions, after partitions. And because it is true that a lot of people, uh, most Americans, don't really know where Poland is. Maybe we should think about creating like a network of Polish or American interested in Poland, the scientists or people of different professions, so we can support each other, um, network together, and really talk about the, the program, what it did for us. Because, um, you know, individuals, we don't have such a big power. I know we, are, we belong to different institutions, and I don't know if that would be a role maybe of Columbia University or of, of other organizations. Well We're facing a uh, situation where there might not be any Polish language anymore be being taught at Columbia soon, which probably it kind of uh, gives you an, an impression that it wasn't really popular. Now why? It's really difficult to say. First of all, it's definitely not an easy language. And I, I, I have a feeling that every class is being treated individually, like especially the Polish classes, but it should be treated, uh, it should be in a context with all other classes. Now, the whole school, every class at Columbia is very different, time-taking, requires a lot of effort. So every class that it's in addition to the, the, to the required core curriculum, it's, 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 you make your life extremely difficult if you take a difficult language class. So there's only a very few students here that are willing to take difficult core classes that we all have to take and on top of that add another difficult class. That kind of contributes to really the problem that it's really not a popular language. Often students choose easy languages because they want to have some sort of more of maybe utility out of it in the future than a difficult language and then hope for some utility out of it. Now, what I did realize uh, or notice that those that are interested in Polish classes, they're often in some sort of relationship with Polish native speakers. So wives, girlfriends, uh, you know, uh, uh, kids of the parents that speak Polish and they don't. So for the, but this is a very, very small and narrow group. So that's a, that I think why the Polish, teaching Polish language is really not that popular. Now what Professor Frajsz was also doing was teaching Polish literature courses. And I think that is a little bit more popular, especially for myself, and I'm a, a Polish native speaker, because let's say I took a class at Polish literature after 1989, and I could not take that anywhere in Poland, so for me this was a really great opportunity to, to find out and study and be uh, exposed to that sort of literature, and I really enjoyed that class with Professor Freilich, I think it was a great class. And it was a popular class as well. Now, classes about you know very historical writers, Mitskevich and, and, and others, are really not that popular because the kids or younger students don't really find it very interesting. I don't know if that answers your question, but you have to treat not the classes at Columbia all together with other classes versus just how is the Polish language. Because I feel it's not the Polish language that will give you success in life, but it's the whole education from school that will contribute to your future su success in life. And that's how I think you should con consider that. I byliśmy też w Czechosłowacji, w Węgrach i w Polsce. W tych latach, to znaczy w, w tym momencie, to było tak ciekawe być w, w Polsce, bo, bo, bo to był 
tuż po komunizmu, wszystko było e, no, taki bałagan, ale ciekawy bałagan w Polsce. I potem, kiedy byłem na Columbia University jako e, doktorant, ja myślałem, no, ja, ja chcę um, wiedzieć więcej o Polsce. Polish has been absolutely essential to my career as a scholar and a professor. I spent lots of time in the Polish archives and using documents from Poland uh, has enabled me to, to do the kind of history that I do. But it, the origin moment, I would say, was in 1991, just after the fall of communism, which sparked my interest and led me down the path towards um, trying to, to become proficient in, Fol in Polish and to use Polish in my own historical work. Um, a big inspiration for me wanting to learn Polish um, was uh, the Polish friends I made in New Jersey. Um, they were very not superficial people and very nice to me. Um, so I wanted to learn more about the culture um, and learning the language is an important part of that and so even though I had some uh, Polish heritage going back decades on my mother's side of the family um, we never got to experience it growing up we didn't eat any pierogi or any sauerkraut or anything um, and so it wasn't until I made uh, friends later in life that I was exposed to that culture and I was interested in learning more.